I'm too addicted to making YouTube videos to say this is <laughs> my last technical video, but it does have the distinction in that it is the, I think, last major computer video that immediately jumped to mind as a video I should make when I started making YouTube videos. I'm making some of these videos, such as the last one on memory management and this one and some others, because regardless of the course that I was teaching, there were certain recurrent themes and I developed my own little spiels, my own little pseudo-histories of how things worked that over time I was actually rather pleased with and I wanted to be able to record them for my own benefit so that if I ever started teaching again I could uh, view them and not have to reinvent the wheel with quite as much difficulty. The goal of my little pseudo-histories is to provide a, a framework, a justification for certain ideas so that they become internalized, so that you say, okay, yes, I feel good about this, I have a clue what we're doing uh, and why that's happening. And uh, in this case, what I want to talk about is the .NET framework. If you're a programmer, you may be put in the, in the situation of programming with the .NET framework, and you may be happy with it or you may not, but regardless of which one you are, I think you will be happier off, if happier, if you say, why do we have the .NET framework? What questions is it answering that I would like, what problem is it addressing? So I'm going to give you one of my pseudo-histories. They're pseudo-histories because they may be just totally wrong. But the general thrust of them and the pattern of the development of thinking is intended to be correct. And I felt, uh, you know, although it's presumptuous to compare myself, uh, Richard Feynman did this sort of thing and said that's what he's doing. You know, if you want to get to the details of what the history is, he didn't care what the history was, but he wanted to tell you a history that would make sense that would tie these ideas together. Now, in fact, the actual history of a lot of this is interesting, but that's not what this is about in a technically precise way. Once upon a time, we had, com Once upon a time we had a computer. We had computers. I have described uh, memory to some small degree in a previous uh, video, the one posted previously to this one. And that might help understand this one. A computer consists of uh, memory from zero to however much memory you have. And the idea is we put instructions in these and it starts at a certain place and keeps going and executes one instruction after another sequentially unless the instruction tells it to jump to something out of sequence. And then some of the places in here never get jumped to for the purpose of executing an instruction. They get jumped to to peek into that memory location to see what the data is or to modify the data. So we have a path of execution in here that is going from instruction to instruction that may not be next to each other. And there may be data interspersed in there as well. Now, when people started writing computer programs, they went in and they wrote in binary the little codes, ones and zeros, and this meant jump to here, and this meant add these two numbers together, and this. So these things meant things. Very, very cryptic. So they came up with mnemonic representations of the ones and zeros that said move this from here to there or add this. And that was called assembly language. So you would write in a cryptic language, but at least the words looked like a human language. Instead of saying 101101, you said add. Then when you ran it through the assembler, it took ahead and went ahead and wrote the assembly language that you could have written yourself, but would have been much more difficult. Many people know how to write both ways. I don't. I've taken a course on assembly language, and that's fine but it doesn't help me be productive in the way that I want to, so I'm going to start at a higher level, not meaning smarter level, but meaning at a level that builds on the shoulders of others and accepts what they have done to get my work done. So uh, we have this memory going along. Now, when people were writing these original programs, they discovered a lot of things that they were doing over and over again that were not specific to the individual program they were writing. All programs did them, or many of them did them, and one of the things that had to be done was to load the program from whatever the storage medium was, in our case disk, into RAM. So that's where CPM came from and some other operating systems. The code that loads the program into memory is very similar regardless of what the program is. 
So we have an operating system that does that. You know, when you press a key on a keyboard, you might see a letter appear uh, on the screen. And you might think that's automatic. As a matter of fact, it's not nearly as automatic as you might suspect. There's actually code that has to intercept the signal there, decide if you're in Windows which application it goes to, has to decide whether to display it at all, and some other things. So there are these types of issues that go on for, for instance, echoing a character to the screen. All programs have issues like that, totally independent of what the program does, whether it's an accounting program, a graphics program, whatever. Obviously, among certain types of programs, there will be greater overlap than others. So, uh, if we go ahead and take a bundle of application code that is going to be shared by multiple applications dealing particularly with interacting with hardware, interacting with keyboards, screens, printers, memory, serial ports, network cards. I take those things and put them together in a central repository and have one place on your computer where all programs will access them. That's pretty much what uh, an operating system does. It's, it's sort of risky defining operating system like that because people will come back, well, what about this, what about that? Get the big picture here. It's a bunch of reusable code accessible by all, all programs to do common sorts of things regardless of what the actual specific purpose of the program is. Now, uh, I so the operating system is a bunch of code accessible to all programs. The problem with operating systems is that they are subject to enormous abuse by the programmer. And because it is code that is accessible to all programs, accessing common resources like keyboard screens, printers, that sort of stuff, each program has the capability of crashing the system, which is not a good thing. So let me draw some pictures here trying to represent the way we can think of computer memory, and uh, the uh, I'm going to draw here something that isn't memory, it isn't really anything. It's layers of abstraction. It's building thought like bricks on top of other thought as bricks. Uh, for instance, you know, when I drive a car, I don't have to be thinking of how an internal combustion engine works. I have that. That's a given. That is part of the infrastructure of my existence. We use infrastructure broad, more broadly than we often do. Very often we're saying infrastructure like roads and, and uh, utilities and that sort of stuff. In a programming environment, an infrastructure is anything that's there before you start doing anything. It's the operating system. It's other code that's available to you. So basically, when we have a computer, we start out at our bottom layer of stuff with hardware. And one of the early problems with uh, computers was that each program that was running, especially if you had more than one, had to interact with the hardware itself. How do we coordinate this contention between users? Well, sometimes we didn't. We didn't do it very well. In the 1980s, it was a little bit easier because programs like uh, CPM and DOS really pretty much only let you run one program at a time. So we weren't contending for resources. But as we came across programs that were multitasking, which basically means you run more than one program at a time, or multi-threading, which is where one program does multiple things at a time within the same process, a rather subtle difference that, that confuses me from time to time unless I stop and work it out. So we have hardware and we have programs that want to interact with it. And the early people who were writing pure assembly language with no operating system, you can use assembly language with operating system, but they were interacting directly with hardware and doing everything like real human. Now they weren't getting very far compared with what you can do with modern programming languages, but it still required a deep understanding of the computer and uh, anybody who can do that it should be just justifiably be pleased with the intellectual human they have uh, demonstrated. So we have hardware. Well, what happened is we come up with the idea of an operating system that does certain things like loading the program, but it also has core code in it for, you know, when, you have, when you're a programmer and you're writing something that says, you know, open a window in a program, you don't write the code that opens the program. You call a function in 
the Windows uh, operating system and you say, here, this is how big it is, this is where I want it positioned, this is whether I want it minimized or maximized to start out with, does I want it background color, foreground color, some things like that. You tell it some things, you give it some descriptions, all of which are basically numbers, and then it draws it for you. If you had to figure out how to draw a window every time you open a window as a programmer, you'd never get anything done. So that's a function that is built in the operating system uh, in Windows. And in the before Windows and DOS, there were there were similar lesser issues dealing with hardware and displaying things. Even just getting a character display on the screen at all in a character environment takes a lot more work than you might think. And we say, uh, you know, your computer is operating at gigahertz of instructions. Well, really, those instructions are broken into smaller instructions that nobody ever sees. And it can take just an awful lot of instructions to get to press the key and see something appear on the screen. Maybe somebody has an or idea of order magnitude of that. All right, so we have the operating system, which is essentially a library of functions, library of code. The programmer can rely on it; doesn't have to write it. it makes life much easier. Now, I made a series of videos on object orientation that I posted on the Darwin's Hamster channel and it is uh, also uh, listed as a playlist on another channel that you might be viewing this from. And if you don't know what object orientation is, I always hate it when somebody says, you got to stop and watch that before you go on with this. Well, do whatever you want. But it is an ex explanation of object orientation that I hope is intuitive and helps you understand it. The problem with this is that all of this is exposed to the programmer in such a way that the programmer can wreak havoc on the, can provide invalid parameters, can just do all sorts of things wrong that hurt the functionality of the programmer's own application as well as any other applications concurrently running, if that's all we have. So uh, what happened was, and I'm giving this from a Microsoft historical perspective, uh, again, you can plug in your own tools, things you're familiar with, there's something analogous probably there that happened. I'm going to segment the world here a little bit, and over here I'm going to put the VB world. In 1989 or so, somebody whose name is well known, but I don't remember it right now, Alan something, came up with the idea of Visual Basic. And up until then, if you had wanted to write a Windows-based program, you had to know the Windows API, which, oddly enough, API stands for Application Programmer Interface. Uh, most people who, we still use the term API, Win API, most of the people who write programs now don't know the Application Programmer Interface, even though they are application programmers. What they're really using is something at a higher level that encapsulates that, that is yet another API that may or not be called an API. API is a multiply ambiguous term that always has to be thought through if we care. He came up with the idea of Visual Basic where he included, <coughs> pardon me, in Visual Basic code simply for doing things that was much harder to do in the OS. Now, just because the operating system is a collection of code to make life easy, that is all very relative. The Win API is monstrously difficult for people like me. There is no question that I would not be a programmer if I had to deal with the Win API. And the reason is, the thing that made programming so appealing to me was that I could solve, programs, uh, solve problems I wanted to solve within a reasonable amount of time. For me, using the Win API has never been that way and will never be that way, and I just wouldn't have gone that route. Just wouldn't have happened. Don't have that patience. I need more results faster. So there's the Win API, which is better than writing assembly language, but VB came up in a language that was much more uh, intuitive and similar to other friendly languages that dealt in character-based world and said, okay, you want to open a window? Just say form1.show or something like that, and it'll display. Maybe a little more difficult than that, but not much. It permitted people to create Windows applications where that, that ability was not there, either because people just, weren't, people just weren't interested in wasting their lives on that. There was a time, believe it or not, even as late as 1992, even after Windows 3.1 was out, where there was still questions whether major companies were going to port their applications to Windows. 
and I don't know when the like word perfect for Windows came out, but it was much later than you might have expected. Uh, because they weren't using VB, they were using this, and this was probably considered cheating by them at the time. It might still be. But this was always very difficult. This made it very much easier uh, for sort of political, semi-religious reasons. The VB would be used internally by corporate developers, but not quite as much for people who wrote applications for commercial develop uh, applications that you go and buy shrink wrap someplace. That's a view is probably changing over time. Now what happened is he not only gave us, and this he Allen guy, not only gave us a language for um, doing Windows stuff so easy that then we could focus on the specific problem that makes this application different than other, and that is really tied into the definition of infrastructure. What we want to do is have a programming environment as programmers where I can focus on the specific problem that is unique to the situation I'm in. If it's not, I want it to be part of the infrastructure. And over time, what we want to do is have people add more and more things that I rely on as part of the infrastructure that already exists. I don't want to have to know how serial ports work. I want to be able to use it by using code that encapsulates that functionality in a way that anybody who's going to use it would want. All I have to do is write the code that does my serial port that control such and such a specific device. And if I do that a whole lot, by the way, I'd like to write a chunk of code that I might even be able, for my own purposes, to consider part of the operating system make it even easier. So Visual Basic came along and provided additional infrastructure to the programmer. Not at the operating system level, although at some point it becomes fuzzy and you don't care. But it provided additional infrastructure for doing things so that applications could be developed not only more quickly, but more reliably. If you write a piece of code that opens a window and it seems to work, if you use it in a thousand other places, you're going to find out whether it works in all those circumstances or not. And this type of code would be so it becomes very reliable. Now, the other advantage that code like that had is that over time, Visual Basic became more object-oriented. I'm going to leave that for the time being. I have a series on object orientation. But the point about object orientation is not reliability. We just addressed that. But the fact that it encapsulates things in such a way that the programmer cannot abuse it nearly as many ways as the programmer can otherwise. In other words, it is a big airbag for the benefit of the developer. And the idea is we provide an environment to make it as difficult as possible for the programmer to make mistakes that can be caught before deployment, before compilation, whatever. Wherever we find problems in the process, earlier and earlier on, we're happier. That's where if I can develop a product where things that used to be logic mistakes become syntax mistakes, I'm going to develop faster because syntax mistakes show up much faster. So we have Visual uh, Basic, which is object-oriented. There were other languages. Pick your own world and has some whatever. Now, in the meantime, Microsoft has some competing developers who are writing in a programming language that are called C that eventually becomes C++. And C and C++, I'm going to say some prejudicial bias words here. Just filter all that out. But... There, there's sort of a psychological battle between the VB viewers of the world and the C type and Java type viewers of the world. And the C programmers emphasize speed and flexibility. And the VB programmers emphasize getting the job done well, with as few errors as possible. And the VB programmers say, I don't. I want to know as little about a computer as possible because I want to spend my time understanding the problem I'm trying to solve. All the time you take away from me having to understand the guts of a computer, I could be spending talking to the person who has a problem to solve. The C people, on the other hand, say, well, wait, I can tweak with things at a very low level and make this application very fast. For some applications, that's very important. If I'm writing the actual database engine for SQL Server, that is important because I need to squeeze every last ounce of speed out of it because it's going to be used a zillion ways by people I don't know for purposes I haven't imagined. But in the case of a Visual Basic developer, developing an application for corporate internal use, 
He's going to know at the time he writes the application whether it's fast enough and whether he needs to take additional steps to make it more performant. So these languages are typically used by different types of people for different purposes, and they are mortal enemies. Uh, very often people, uh, it's very difficult to belong to both camps there. Uh, in my own opinion, I taught both languages. I will say that my history is more visual basic than uh, C sharp, C++, that sort of thing. But I consider the whole issue just uh, over time, since the languages are becoming more common, as I'm going to explain, the whole issue is just a total, total waste of time to spend any time discussing. Like, is trying to decide whether it's better to be a Mormon or a Presbyterian. Okay, now, what happened is we had the, the C people over here. And the C people over here, in my pseudo-history that may not totally reflect reality, look over here and say, you know, we're smarter than everybody else, and we're doing a better job, and nobody necessarily appreciates it. But darn those people over here, they're object-oriented, they can do things in a very similar way, uh, simple way much of the time, and we can't, and people are putting the pressure on us to be more productive and less buggy. What are we going to do about it? Well, they came up from C with the language C++, which is object-oriented. But at that point, although they had object orientation, they didn't have the object orientation and the concepts built in VB to say things like, hey, open that window. You still had to call the win API to do low level work for you. So what they did is they came up with a series of classes. And I'm using class here uh, in the way that I use the word type, T-Y-P-E, in the other uh, video. Uh, they came up with a bunch of classes called the Microsoft Foundation MFC classes, Microsoft Foundation classes, which were code you got the source code to. You didn't get the source code over here and that would permit doing a bunch of stuff like that, and it was a big success, and in fact, probably a good bit of the products that you have purchased from Microsoft over the years have contained a good deal of MFC code. Their programmers writing commercial applications tend to be on this side. As a matter of fact, this product itself is probably written in C or C++, and I'm talking there about VB6, by the way. We haven't gotten to, to uh, .NET yet. So we have this competition. Well, somebody stands back in this, and they look at this, and they say, wait a second. We've got these different languages approaching the issue of object orientation uh, and a number of other issues, uh, totally different paths. These people, you know, don't even go to lunch with each other. They run over each other's children's in the street. What are we going to do about that? Well, they stepped back and they said, we are going to come up with a better way. And so this is what they did. They took a bunch of the ideas that they have over time wished they had put in the operating system. And they developed another layer of operating system that includes those features at an even higher level. And they put it in here, so they added stuff that's at a higher level that they've never done before. They made it so that it plugs into the Win API as it's up here, but it provides you more stuff. It provides you ways of, for instance, opening windows and things like that that is independent of a language. We can build a language on top of this that is different. And the two big languages are going to be VB.net and c -sharp. Dot .NET, or just C Sharp, because there isn't any C Sharp that's not dot .NET that I'm aware of. So what is this layer? This layer is called the CLR, the Common Language Runtime, the dot .NET Common Language Runtime. And the idea is, it is a layer of abstraction that intermediates between the programming languages and the operating system to provide common functionality at a higher level of abstraction than the operating system did before. And guess what? It's object-oriented. Uh, as it turns out, uh, it is language independent. So what happens is we write these programs in the source code English-like languages we write. We compile them in a loose use of the word compiling. 
Uh, and then it runs at runtime in the common language runtime. Uh, and you know, there's some other things I could say. I'm not all that far from where I intended to end today, but I am going to end now. Uh, because I need